My next guest in the waiting room, Dale Vincent Hancock, is a certified master coach, speaker, and leader of success. He has had the great privilege of inspiring 80,000 students across 100 facilities worldwide. He has spoken in Parliament and also partnered with Nike to inspire children and build confidence across the globe. He is also the uh, author and publisher of the number one bestseller, Raw Confidence. It is my great pleasure and privilege to introduce my next guest in the waiting room, Dale Hancock. And I hope with your inspiring stories to help not just children, but actually anyone who hears the wonderful and precious stories that you have to share with us. As with so many of my guests, um, can you tell us about where you grew up and about your parents? Absolutely. Rugby was the town I grew up and I had a mum and dad. I still have a mum and dad, very fortunately, as well as a little brother called Kyle. And it was a very humble household and it was full of love and joy. So my dad has always been there and he will always be there for me. There's, he's my one solid rock and my mum, let's not forget. But my father was the one that always dropped me off to sports clubs, karate competitions, swimming competitions, all of them always been there for me. And his love for us is, is unquestionable. And he is one solid role model for me personally in, in, those, in those realms. My brother, yeah, so my, my brother, we've always had a, a sibling relationship. <laughs> and I love him absolutely dearly. He, uh, and I've always been there for him. Uh, but one day I wasn't sick. In fact, I wouldn't say one day, I'd probably say for one year I wasn't there for him. So in his late teens, he, it was obvious to see that his sexuality wasn't straight. He was gay. Still is, funnily enough. <laughs> and he was carefully coming out of the closet by hoping that we'd stumble across it ourselves. We did. And I wouldn't want anyone to know, all my friends to know that my brother was gay. I was ashamed. And that amount of shame back then is mere fibres compared to the shame I feel for saying that and admitting that. And he was coming out of the closet and I was never there for him. My mother was never there for him. And one day, we, we still had conversations with each other. We were still talking, we were still, I was still fine with him. Um, I never really processed what I, what I didn't do. You know, sometimes inaction is an action, and, and, and that was the case with, with my brother. And I thought, I, I thought, you know what, I'm there for him now, it's okay, I'm all accepting. We're in our 30s, I'm, I'm in my 30s, it's fine, he's, he's great, he's happy, I'm happy. And then I was watching a movie called Love, Simon, which was a boy who unfortunately got his, his sexual identity stolen from him. And it was bizarre because I was sitting on the, laying on the couch actually with Laura, and the boy, Simon, came out to his friend and I felt a warm sensation trickle down my cheek. Is that, that's weird. That's strange. Anyway, I'll carry on watching. And I was cuddling my partner like this and she was facing the TV so she couldn't see anything. And then he came out to his mother. Simon came out to his mom. And the pain in my throat was insane. I was really fiercely trying to hold back the tears and the lumps. And what baffled me most was the confusion as to why this was happening. It was like I was fighting against what was right. I was fighting against the love that I've always had for him and always been there for him. But because of my um, narrow-minded dogmatic views based on other people's opinions, my peers, I decided to ignore that and just think, no, let's go for that because I wouldn't want anyone to think less of me because I've got a gay brother. That's crap, absolutely crap. And it just all Persian all came out and I'm so thankful it did. Um, and every single time I bring that up, I can still feel it inside of me, which just reminds me. And I have his birthday to Roman numerals on my shoulder just here to remind me that he's not a chip on my shoulder, he's an angel. 
on my shoulder that reminds me to, to be open-minded. And the reason why I believe I released when he came out, when Simon came out to, to his father in the movie was because I've never been so proud of two people who I love so much. I've, I've, got, I've got a brand new brother now, Suk. Wonderful. His name is Luke. Luke. And he has been married to my brother for over a year now in Disneyland. Wonderful. So it's so cool. I've actually got two brothers and they keep each other in check so I don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell me in all of its rich detail, and I thank you again for the courage you're having mm. in sharing this, how bullying touched you, how bullying shaped you, and how you have become the wonderful person that you are doing the wonderful work you are doing. So the, the usual stories, I guess, I was a new kid at the school and I was bullied both psychologically and physically. And physically, in my view now, is not bullying. There's no such thing as, as physical bullying. That's it's physical abuse. If I was to punch somebody in Tesco, no, the supermarkets are available, but if I was to hit somebody in Tesco, I would expect to be arrested and press charges. Why on earth is that not happening in the schools? Slap on the wrist, no, not even that, a detention. They don't learn anything from that. And both need guidance, the victim and the bully. In fact, I went the other way. I turned into the bully. La. And the reason why I did that was because I thought, actually, if I bully him, then he won't bully me. And I, would, I didn't realise what I was doing, but what I was doing was pushing people further away from me because who wants to be friends with a bully? Nobody wants to be friends with a bully until it, it kind of like backfired on me and, and when I was growing up, when I got into the industry of, of education, I was bullied by a deputy head and, well, that's normal because I was bullied when I was younger, so that's, this is normal behaviour and the, the, the neuro patterns inside your brain is firing in the way of, well, that's normal, so you, because you've done had that before, and that's okay, and it's all underneath the surface, so you don't know what you're doing, you don't know how to do that, you're living through somebody else's patterns that, that was created back then until you've got an awareness of it, and it went into my relationships as well. And I, if I could share what made me go into what I'm doing now, because it kind of coincides with this, in my past relationship, uh, for five years, uh, I had this I had this amazing, beautiful girlfriend. Oh, she was beautiful. And because I was seeking external validation, as all bullies do, external validation, I was, I was just seeing her as a trophy on my arm. Oh, yes. And obviously I went to the gym because I want to make sure I look good and ripped and strong because, you know, the external validation. And my external validation was building up and up and up. It was making me hungry. I wanted more of it. I wanted more of it. And so much so that it was kind of chipping away at my internal validation, my own self-love, my own self-worth, my own self-actualization. And I didn't really mind what she was doing. And what she was doing was having an affair for the entirety of our relationship, as in with copious amounts of other men. And deep down, I had a good feeling this was happening. So what happened was... I lost my job because an area of my department got disbanded, which meant I had to go elsewhere. Two weeks later, I had a car crash. And all of these things, if they happened, you know, singularly, then I'd be fine, I've got kind of car crash, go over it, Dale, go to hospital, sort yourself out, sweet. Lost your job, get another one, come on. And then I found out that my partner, the five years, was seeing other men behind my back. In fact, she... She just snuck out of my tent in Australia, Fraser Island, to be with another man in their tent, do whatever they did, and then come back into my tent, of which I had no idea happened. And I then, three weeks later, my mum had a heart attack. My word, the one lady in my life that's always been there for me and just gave me unquestionable, unconditional love I've just seen how fragile she is. And I had no chance to be, to, to process that because my father was in pieces. My, my brother was in pieces. And I had to step up and I had to say, come on, let's go, let's sort my mum, let's let, let make sure she's okay. I was, I was the face, I was the face, the happy face, the fun face. Inside I was dying, absolutely dying. 
but I didn't want to let mum see that at all. And she's fine, by the way, now she's okay. She's all sorted. She's, she's just attention seeking, that's what <laughs> <laughs> um, And um, I know you probably want to give me a bit of a slap around the face right now, but I got back with my ex because it was that familiarity. And, you know, I wouldn't want to be myself because I was searching for that external validation, approval from other people by being with somebody. I wouldn't want to be by myself to be left with this. And then um, over Christmas, she knew what happened to my mom. Over Christmas, she fell pregnant with somebody else's baby. And that stung a lot. Again, forgave her again. I, I took her to the abortion clinic to sort that out because the person in question was married don't do that. And I, my father's always said, Dave, you've got to do the right thing. The only person called me Dave, for some reason. Dave, Dave, you've got to do the right thing. And the right thing tends to be the hardest thing. You can do what's right, do what's easy. And oh, I hated that in my head. Morally, I, it was the right thing to do, even though it wasn't, you know, she didn't want to be alone. And a lot of people call me a mug for doing that, but I'm glad that I did. And then I forgave her again. Then I found a, a few t few weeks, some months later, I found another gentleman inside. Say gentleman, use that term very loosely. Um, in my house, of which point I just looked at him. He was a giant of a man, a rugby player. He was towering over me. And I just walked in and just laughed and said, you all right, mate, what are you doing in my house? And it was just, it was very, very sheepish. And he said, oh, I should probably go. I said, no, 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 you stay, sit down. Let's, let's have a chat. So how long has this been going on for then? And at which point I just kind of, I didn't lose it. Again, I was putting on that face. And then that was enough enough. I, I, she had to be removed from my, my environment. It was very toxic. I didn't hate her as m nearly as much as I hated myself for snooping on her phone and seeing who she's messaging. And, and actually at one point, this is what it drove me to, I got her phone. I connected a charger to my computer and I downloaded some software to find out deleted pictures and deleted messages. What a waste of eight hours. I am, so I am never getting those hours back in my life. They've gone. They have gone. I've put the time coins in that slot and it's been spent. And I wasted it on air. And I just despised who I was, which was far worse than despising who she was. We just brought the worst out in each other. And she was going through what she was going through. Why on earth would anybody want to do that without something quite kind of functioning correctly up here or in socially up there? She, she had to go. So I managed to find 15,000 pounds from people, parents, friends, to buy out the property. And at that point, that loneliness shattered me because it's, it's a crazy thing seeing yourself through other people's eyes. What if they think I'm this? What if they think I'm that? But it's nothing compared to seeing yourself through your own eyes and realizing you don't even know that person. Who, who is that person? What is this identity? And I just saw blankness, like blank, dead eyes. I can't really, there's no other way to put that. No, I, I just went downhill, I just went downhill. I, I didn't go to the gym anymore, I didn't know what to do. And randomly, to cut a long story short, it, video on YouTube by Tony Robbins popped up. <laughs> You're the power of your mind! Rah! And I'd, I'd never researched him before. I'd never researched Pussy Federman. So for that advert to pop up was bizarre. But I felt like he was talking to me. It's very strange. And I thought, wow, Tony, you mean I don't have to wallow in self-pity anymore? Great. Okay, let's do something about it. But I didn't really know what to do. So I stuck to what I was found familiar, which was going to the gym and going to the gym working out. And randomly enough, there was a chap there who I knew of, wasn't really that close to, who studied neuro-linguistic programming as a master trainer at NLP. 
and he was talking to me, and, and he was talking to me in a different way than not many people spoke to me before, and I found it quite interesting. And I asked him if I could, if I could train with him. I said, dude, can I, can I train with you? It's like whenever you train, if that's okay. I said, yeah, of course you can, mate, that's fine. I didn't want to train for him to lift weights. I knew how to do that perfectly well, but what I didn't know were the words, his mindset, his thoughts, his beliefs, his values, his morals. I didn't know that, I haven't heard of that before. It's very profound. And what was odd was that he was younger than me, a young, uh, an old soul. And it was very, it, it was almost as if he shone a light in every my brain and never knew it existed. It's like I was, I was using 1% uh, of my brain. I was now using 10%. You can't use 100% of your brain. It'd be great if you could. And he recommended his coach, so I, I got a bit of coaching from him. I, I was fascinated. I went on an NLP course, um, spent whatever it need, I needed to spend on it, and he changed me. His name, was, his name is Bevis, a beautiful man. Oh, such a kind soul, wonderful. And I was getting my confidence back. In fact, I didn't really have any confidence to begin with, really. I, it was all, for me, it was all a facade. It was fake confidence. So I was getting this, this unknown feeling inside of me, but it felt good. It felt very good. So I wanted to use it. So I thought, you know what? I just wanted to go on a TV game show. That would be fantastic. I'd love to do that. So I applied for Ninja Warrior. I didn't get on. I applied again. I didn't get on. And I was like, oh, okay. Um, but then ITV rang with me and said, Dad, we love your videos. Why don't you apply for this show instead? It's called Cannibal. So, wow, okay, what's it involve? So it's a bit like Total Wipeout. You, there's four activities, water-based activities. It's set in Malta. I'm in. That sounds great. I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> so they took me to Malta. I went through all the stages, I passed all the stages. It was really brilliant. And I remember on the plane, I remember on the plane, flying over there, I need to have three intentions because my coach always said that. So what's my first intention? To have a ridiculous amount of fun. To meet new people and speak to a girl because girls suck, freaked me out. They were all devil women in my eyes. <laughs> all of them were, apart from my mom. And to win because my mom always said to me, Dale, if, I don't care if you lose. I don't care what, if, what happens in a competition or whatever. As long as you aim to win. You go in there and, and aim to win. And she's always said that to me before she knew I was going on this TV show. So that, those are those my intentions. And it was strange because on the bus journey from the airport to the hotel, I had a GoPro and I thought, you know, I'm going to fake confidence. I'm going to fake it. No one knows me here. I don't care. Whatever, whatever happens, happens. And I got up with my GoPro, did a selfie video. I said, hey, guys, who's going to win this? You know, you're not going. I'm going to win. Oh, where are you from? Really? I'm from Ruby. And we were just talking, talking, talking. Conversation led to, oh, who wants to do a workout on the beach? Unbeknown to me, Malta doesn't have any beaches. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and people were piping up. And then this, 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 this girl pipes up. And um, she was the opposite looking of my ex-partner. For me, that's amazing. Blonde hair, green eyes, amazing. And she said, oh, I'll come to do a workout within the beach. And I was like, oh, okay. Well, I'm going to talk to you now. Hi, how are you doing? My name's Dale. Nice to see you. Nice to meet you. Where are you from? Blah, blah, blah. So I'm we did not shut up for the entirety of the bus journey. It was about four hours. And we were continuing talking, talking, talking. Uh, went to lunch. All of us went, so excuse me, for dinner together. All We sat opposite each other. We were talking throughout that. It was, it was like a firework relationship. We actually began, began dating on the show. Very American dating. Yeah. We began dating on the show. It was fantastic. Oh, my God. And um, it, was, it was like I was in some form of modern Disney movie. I did not know what was happening. And I haven't finished just yet because I think you know where this is going. But I went onto this TV set and I looked at the beautiful oranges, the big blues, this, the, the sand, the, the sky, the ocean, the, the sun. And it was like a, a wave of knowing, not belief, knowing swept over me. It was like... I'm going to win this show. I've already won. I'm going, to, I'm going to win the show. And the producers asked me, they asked everybody who's going to win. I said, oh, I'm going to win. I'm going to win. I was a bit arrogant. Isn't it? Not really. I haven't really put anyone else down. I believe arrogance is, is me staying at this level and me put.
pushing people below me. That's arrogance. Confidence is me going, just here and not comparing myself to other people. I just know that I'm going to win. And I went on the show. It was activities such as going down a giant slide, three stories high and swooping off into the air to see if you can get the furthest to wear a giant ball and fall down pins, get as high as you can on the blob. One was to skim across the water as fast as you possibly could, of which I won, which meant I should call a place in the final, which was amazing. And to cut a long story short, that we had to swing off this giant rope, again, three stories high, and land in these, these giant rings that were projected by light, and we had to land in the centre. And I came last in the first swing. There was only three people in the final. I came last in the first swing. I came first in the second swing, which meant I was in second place overall. And I, it was very, it was, I, just, I just relaxed. Because the final swing, the centering reduced its size by 50%, and it was moving all over the place. I just timed it perfectly, landed bang, straight in the middle. Freddie Flintoff was shouting, oh, the Dale, the mindset guru. Whoa. And um, Frankie from the Saturdays, Maya Jammer were, were, were there, and Maya Jammer was supporting me, so I was, I was super stoked about that. Radzi from Blue Peter. And I just remember celebrating almost half fast because I knew it was going to happen. And then I got on stage and they said, oh, well done, Dale, you've won. Oh, yeah. And I remember flying on the way back and it was more than the trophy. I actually found something that has been with me the whole time because I said that I'm going to fake confidence. There was no faking about it. That was the real me showing up. And by some wild stretch of the imagination. If I can show children at the most quintessentially important stage of their life that you have got a stupid amount of confidence inside of you, you just need to find the right key and the right door to open it up, then I am winning at life. And that's what I wanted to do. No, I didn't. I know I don't take kids on a TV game show to find it, and there's my methods to do that via NLP, CBT, and silent therapy, as well as the physical sports that I'm qualified to, to coach. And I found the best way to do this is to combine the physicality and the psychology together to build those stronger neuro patterns of confidence in their brain. Um, and it was it was crazy. It was I won the whole TV game show. I got the girl, I, all, all because of of a change in my own self-actualization, self-confidence. Self-confidence is the opposite of self-consciousness in my mind. I wanted to be the hero of my own movie. And every single day since then, I have been the hero of my own movie. If I'm going to write a book about myself, I'm not going to give you the pen. You're a great man. I love you to pieces, but I wouldn't give you the pen. I, I, I'm going to write my own story. Thank you very much. Which was wonderful. Um, and I'm... I'm, I'm Again, it was a firework relationship with this girl. Where we're not together anymore. She lived in Manchester. It was it was it was too far away, which was which was wonderful. It was it. I I I got back to where I live, and and I was I just loved my own company. It was amazing. And and when you when you love your own company, when you start to love yourself, certain people gravitate into your life. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm so blessed and fortunate to have Laura, who is just amazing. She's absolutely, she's, she's, she doesn't know this because I've never told her. Perhaps I should tell her. <laughs> but she's a bit of a role model in my life as well, what she's had to endure. So, um, yeah, it was such, it was like a modern Disney movie, which I got to live because I got out of my own way and I found my own confidence. And I want to show children how to find their confidence because I believe confidence is in the eye of the beholder. It's relative to to everybody. But children don't really get the chance to explore their own thoughts and understand who they are and understand, well, actually, Frankie has just called me an idiot. But is that because he thinks he's an idiot? And I can tell you that is a fact because you, you, in order to project a thought to somebody, you have to see it in yourself first. And that works positively as well. So I, I've said, I think you're fantastic. So in, in, a, in a roundabout way, I think that I'm fantastic. And I am. Because the chances of me being here are so slim. 
and yourself as well. And I attempt every single day to make, or I do, make at least five people smile. So if a child is going through bullying, they must first understand that, give yourself a break. It's not about you, it's about the other person. Understand your body language, because if you were to turn yourself into a target, the bullying is going to continue. They say, if you laugh for long, but still have that security in yourself that you know yourself, three times, the bullying will stop. And, and children do come to me and say, well, Dale, what about physical bullying? Oh, that's not, that's not bullying, that's physical abuse, and that needs to be reported straight away. What, well, yeah, but I'm a snitch. <laughs> I would rather be called a snitch than suffer that. We're all very proud of our healthcare service here. Mm. What would you say, given your experiences, given what your mum had to go through, and, and heaven forbid anyone who's had to lean on um, healthcare professionals uh, to help themselves, what would you say to NHS workers, to healthcare workers in this country? Oh, my gosh. Thank you for being the backbone. <laughs> I mean, yeah, they get paid, it's a job, yay, well done, fantastic. But there's a certain amount of difference in them. It's almost like a character, like that, that desire to serve. Who, where does that come from? Where does that come from to make people feel and be better? It's not just the fact that oh, I'm going to put you on in plaster, I'm going to make sure. Yeah, you're going to give you an injection. Every single time that I've been to the hospital, the doctors, the staff there have just been so warm. There's something inside them that, that just, it's almost like an extension of a family. You know, it's very strange. That, it's like they're always going to be there for you. Yes. And I'm very grateful for them. And I'm sure they'll be received so gratefully. Mm. And so thank you. Uh, an unfair exercise for us to end on. And you're only allowed to say one line. <laughs> <laughs> um, before you became a bully, when you were being bullied, what would you have said to yourself? I would say, dude, it's okay. Be your best friend and love that guy and at the time that you became a bully as a as a protective mechanism what would you say to your younger self i wouldn't i'd just give him a cuddle and just squeeze him tight as, as tight as i possibly could as long as he needed I always like to think if I'm to give someone a, an embrace, I allow them to let go first. Wonderful. And during that time that you were struggling and you spoke so honestly and courageously, uh, during the time that Kyle was struggling and needed you, what would you have said to yourself then? I would have been physical and I know I shouldn't have done, but I always look back and despite me forgiving myself, I would, I would say, do you want to lose this person? Think of the worst case scenario. Do you want to lose this person? And then I just walk away. <laughs>